Right, well, I'm going to begin, I mean, just by saying how much I loved the movie. I saw it back at the London Film Festival, and I think I that image of Adil sort of dancing on a car at, at dusk, <laughs> I just couldn't get it out of my head for so long. It was such a wonderful scene and movie. Um, I just, well, I'm going to begin by asking about the sort of genesis, really, of the project, project and when this idea sort of first came to you. And, 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 and yeah, because well, I was reading that sort of Adil was actually involved from quite a, an early stage. Yeah, Deal was involved from the get-go, really. We we met in 26, uh, 2016 at the um, Toronto Film Festival and, you know, wanted, knew we wanted to work together. Um, I then sort of came back to him with a one-page idea about what it was that I wanted to do. And he said, OK, I'm in. Um, I also met... Um, someone called Rio while I was making um, The Selfish Giant and she inspired the character of Ava um, and someone called Moe Hassan who was um, who was a DJ landlord and actor and had a small part in um, The Arbor uh, and he inspired the character of Ali so yeah that's how it began. Because uh, yeah, what I loved is that Ali and Ava are what make up the fabric of this nation. On every street in every town, there are Ali and, and Ava's all over Britain. Do you feel a kind of responsibility that comes? And is this part of what drives you in some ways to tell the stories of those who otherwise we don't generally see on screen very often? Yes, absolutely. And that is a really lovely way to put it. Mm. Yeah, it, for the, I really wanted to see so-called ordinary lives mm. writ large um, and to show how extraordinary so-called ordinary lives are. Mm. Because I, I also love this idea that anyone can fall in love at any stage. I mean, do you think that's something that, I mean, that we you wish we saw a bit more of in the arts? Because romance is such a young person ideal in cinema, isn't it? <laughs> but it's it really, when you see a, when we see a project like this, you realise how infrequently we do see it. Mm -hmm. uh, when you when you see two people a bit older, <laughs> uh, um, sort of, yeah, finding feelings for each other. Yeah, yeah, it feels like it's quite a rare thing. And um Yes, so I think you can fall in love at any age, yeah. Mm. And, and I guess, yeah, it felt important to, to show that. I'm interested in the casting. I mean, obviously, a deal was that you mentioned was was involved very early on. But did you have to see them both together uh, before um, casting? Was it, yeah, just to get a sense of their kind of um, their connection, I suppose, the chemistry? Yeah, we, we uh, did what we ended up calling a chemistry test, which was really just to see how... Um, you know, Ideal obviously was already, we'd done a lot of workshops with, or I had done a lot of workshops with him to sort of build the character and build the, the story. Um, and then Claire came in and they improvised the scene on the sofa of with the headphones. Um, and yeah, they they just had a brilliant energy together, brilliantly brilliant they sparked off each other basically, and they made me laugh and cry within that within within that session so yeah it was kind of clear that Claire was the the person to play Ava yeah she brings such so much humanity to that role doesn't she you must mm -hmm. be so you must be so thrilled they did have that chemistry because I guess if you'd already you sort of saw them like that in your head you still need to see them together in order to go right it does work so you must have been quite relieved if anything yeah kind of thrilled really yeah because yeah it's and it's exciting in a way that not quite knowing who quite who Ava's going to be until she's until we cast her and yeah I just think yeah Claire's I just think Claire's got this incredible yeah huge sort of vulnerability and humanity and she's very open and yeah so they 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 were fantastic together in in the room and and so yeah it was exciting to then get them on screen yeah, because I was when I saw was in the, the cinema zone, well, I was watching a trailer, and my wife turned to me and said, um, I really want to see that. And she said Adil is one of the best actors working today. And it only kind of got me thinking, actually, he really is, isn't he? He's kind of been bubbling under the surface, kind of taking on so many brilliant roles over the last kind of two decades. Because I first saw him in Four Lions and then slowly just becoming one of those kind of most dependable, brilliant actors on, on screen. Does it, are, you, are you sort of, I mean, because obviously he is such a sort of a, a brilliant actor, but it, was, it almost surprise you that he's still not, you know, kind of the household name he deserves to be? I think he will be. <laughs> <laughs> he's becoming that. I mean, yeah, it was really lovely sort of pushing him to the front. And I mean, you know, he's, he's played, he's done leads before, but just, yeah. He's such, he's got such an amazing mind to deal. He's just, a, he's a really wonderful person to be around. And he's also, um, 
yeah, I just think he's quite exceptional, really. Must have been quite fun directing him, dancing on top of that car. And it, what looked probably like it was, it looked pretty chilly. <laughs> it, was, well. it was, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun working with both of them. And, you know, like they're, both of them were so uh, committed and, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what 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 song would it would, would get you dancing on top of a car at dusk? Oh, I think it'd have to be that Daniel Avery track, Drone Logic. <laughs> <laughs> I really love that track, and that that would get me dancing. Yeah. In oh. fact, I played it this morning ahead of doing <laughs> ahead of doing this session because because uh, yeah, it's it it's a brilliant track. <laughs> what would get you dancing on top of a car? Uh, well, well, that's a good question. <laughs> I think probably a bit of disco. I reckon. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> no, but it was just funny because I was actually going to ask you what was the name of that song because obviously when you're in a cinema you can't shazam it and I was kind of like I had to rush off after so I couldn't stay right to the end of the credits so Daniel Avery it is a great song <laughs> yeah so it's a really good song yeah. um, so what is it about Bradford that keeps bringing you back anyway, as, a, as a place to tell stories um, well Andrea Dunbar I would say who was the subject of the Arbor you know that was um, it was making that film that took me to Bradford Arbor, this very specific street where she grew up in Bradford. And really it was through meeting, through meeting people whilst making that film that I then made The Selfish Giant because there was a boy with a, with a horse who, um, who I got to know while making that film. And really it was through then making that film that this film came about. So it's kind of like one's triggered the next, if you see what I mean. Just, just from meeting brilliant, brilliant people, basically. Yeah. Yeah, you say obviously, you know, you, you like telling stories of kind of ordinary people. As a storyteller yourself, do you find that when you're out meeting people and, con you know, sort of when you're sort of just traveling the world, going to festivals, even just at home or doing what you do, um, do you find that you are kind of looking for stories, maybe even subconsciously when you meet people? Do you think you're always trying to see the stories within them and things that could then be brought to screen? I think everybody has got a story. And so it's almost like, God, which one? Mm. Because, um, yeah, and, and also I think I'm definitely more of a, I'd rather be doing what you're doing than what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm, right, I'm definitely more, more of a listener, I think, than, a, um, than, a, than, um, than the person who wants to be talking about themselves, if you see what I mean. So, um, yeah, uh, there's, that I think that's the thing, is it, it, this one street in Bradford, all of these there's so many stories. Everybody's got a story, and everybody's got a story that's worth that that's worth telling. So it's the the difficulty is in choosing one <laughs> or landing on one. You know, yeah. As a well, as as a listener, then do you, can you see yourself ever sort of moving into sort of, sort of documentary format? You know, kind of being more of an interviewer, sort of behind the scenes and creating a story that way. Well, um, in a way, that, that's, what, that's what the Arbor was. The Arbor was a sort of um, documentary. It was a hybrid, really. And in some ways, I think there, there were some parts of the process of building the script, which, which come from that sort of discipline, I suppose, in that I'll go and sit with people for hours and hours and hours and, and do very long interviews, but also just hang out with people. But I don't take a camera. You know, I'll, I'll record sound and make a record of of what happened and sort of put it into a script or a workshop in some way. So, yeah. Am I right thinking you teach film as well? Is that right? Have I... Uh, I did. I did. Oh, you... I don't anymore, but I did. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask if you found that that pro because through that process, you felt you understood more about your own craft and, the, and, and your and you as a filmmaker by teaching it to others. Um, I think back when I made The Arbor, um, I taught a course, well, I sort of um, devised a course about, about documentary. And I think that, that some of the questions that The Arbor raises about documentary and fiction came out of teaching that course. Yeah. 
So what's what's sort of next for you then? Have you got another? Because I was reading about the the Essex Serpent. I mean, I, I, mean, I was wondering about um, does it feel? Because it now feels like you know making a a, a a TV show, even if you could be sort of a, a film a filmmaker, so to speak, it's something that it's almost feeling inevitable. I think obviously Andrew Haig did it quite recently as well. Is that has that surprised you? You're sort of moving into that medium. Was that always been behind in some in a sort of plan all along in the back of your mind? Definitely hasn't been a plan in the back of my mind. No, no. And it was a very, it's very different kind of work. You know, it was, you know, it's television. I didn't write it. It's um, an adaptation, a pretty faithful adaptation of a novel. You know, it's very, it was kind of, a, it was, um, it was a, it's diff, very different from, from, you know, the work that I've, my, my, my own independent films. Yeah. But do you have a, another film, any projects brewing at the moment? Lots of things brewing, but yeah, probably too early <laughs> to say what they are. <laughs> All I wanted to hear was yes. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much uh, for your time. It's always a pleasure speaking to you and I'm sure we'll catch up again one day. Yeah, thank you. All right, take care. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, Is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice.